Hello, one and all, and welcome to the Web EV Talk Series. This is a podcast. My name is Jan Lertval, and I'm a professor in Gothenburg in Sweden. And today, I'm very honored to have Grasa Raposo, a CNRS researcher at uh, Institut Curie in Paris, France, a legend in the exosome and exocellular vesicle field for the important work you did uh, back in the 90s when you showed that um, B cell exosomes could present antigens to C cells. And, and you've continued working in the field since then. So welcome to the podcast, uh, Grasa. Thank you for coming. Thank for you joining. for the invitation. Yes. So, Thank so you. why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and, and tell us a little bit where you come from and how you, how you came into the exosome field from the very beginning. So, so I did my, my PhD in, uh, in Paris, uh, already working in endocytosis and exploiting electron microscopy. You know, in a time in the late 80s where finally electron microscopy was kind of old fashioned but i yeah. was really at, i really like to to look at cells and see what cells had, had to tell me mm -hmm. and um and then after my phd i went for a first postdoc in the um, immunology center in marseille where i really start getting interested in the cell biology of immune cells and uh, trying to understand uh, in immune cells where uh, antigens can meet uh, MHC class two molecules and how they can get presented. I mean, in the context of uh, major histocompatibility class two, so basically uh, that are expressed in B lymphocytes, dendritic cells. Mm -hmm. And so in Marseille, uh, I, I basically, I, I didn't stop doing electron microscopy, but I, it was the new era of the confocal microscope. So I went oh, yeah. to Marseille Beginning. to really, in the 90s, I mean, early, early 90s, to, to start doing confocal microscopy, because at the time we saw that the confocal could overpass, you know, somehow the use mm -hmm. of the electron microscope. And... Uh, that I was not convinced of, but uh, I think it was very useful to to really combine the immunofluorescence and confocal microscopy at the time with uh, the first prototypes of confocal microscopes. And uh, but still, I was um, I, I I really wanted to continue doing electron microscopy. And then um, in a meeting, I met uh, Hans Hoese, who was uh, who is uh, very well known nationally recognized electron microscopist who was already working on the on the on MHC class 2 group molecules and on the trafficking of MHC class 2 molecules exploiting electron microscopy and that's in so, Utrecht in Utrecht yeah so I was while I was a postdoc in the in the immunology center and when I met Hans uh, I just went to Hans and I told Hans I mean can I join your lab? Because this is exactly what I want to do. <laughs> That's the way to do it, right? <laughs> but I mean, there was a, a the the thing is that uh, you know I was not alone. Huh? I had a, mm -hmm. you know I had other a people small wanted son. as well. Yeah. yeah, I had a small son, and uh, I was not alone. But this was exactly what I wanted to do, and so he told me, I mean, come and join, you know, because I'm really searching for. Uh, young researchers and young, I mean, and postdocs that could have already some training in electron microscopy, mm -hmm. which in our generation was very rare because most mm -hmm. were trained in the biochemistry or molecular biology. So basically, uh, I mean, I, I, I started organizing my life to, to go with the family to the Netherlands and uh, it worked. So in the in 1st of January 1993, uh, I joined the, the team of Hans Hoese in the Netherlands. And uh, I started really working in a nice collaboration initially with uh, Hide Ploeg, who just moved at the time to MIT. And the team of Hide Ploeg with Hans Hoese were the first showing that basically MHC class two molecules are present in organelles that have all the features of uh, late endosomes and lysosomes, which was a kind of strange, you know, why these molecules that are active, why mm -hmm. are they in a sort of these degradative compartments? Mm, this yes. Was, this was a Nature paper in uh, 1990 
that was uh, that made a, a good point, you know, on the on the cell biology of uh, immune cells, a paper by Peter Peters, and uh, in the team of Hans Reus in collaboration with uh, Ida Plur and Jack Navishes, and um, and basically um, when I joined there, I. I, I pursued on the collaborations with uh, Ida Plur, first working on MHC class one, and uh, but still there was a lot of questions on the field of MHC class two. So, what, what were the experiments you were actually doing when you came to Utrecht? When I went to Utrecht, I really uh, continued training on electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. I first worked on MHC class one in the timeless. You know, to understand uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, I first yeah. worked, uh, this was my first project uh, together with uh, the team of Ida Plur. But then with Hans, we continue discussing about the unknowns on MHC class two. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I pursued on the projects that were basically started by Peter Peters because Peter mm -hmm. Peters then left to, to the team of uh, Rick Klausner in Bethesda as a postdoc. And, uh, and following on the first observations that MHC class two were present in these late endosomes, lysosomes, in these organelles that are called MHC class two compartments. Yeah. My, my, the project that we decided to develop with, uh, with Hans was to kind of understand how these molecules, MHC class two molecules, that are present in so-called degradative compartments, how these molecules can be transported to the plasma membrane. And so, 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 had you, uh, so you basically took immune cells uh, and B cells, six, we were six, on B cells and sectioned them. B, 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 B cells. Yeah. And um, what we did is that um, uh, looking by electron microscopy, we, we didn't stimulate the cells, nothing, you know, just look on the cells. So MHC mm -hmm. class two are present in B cells at the plasma membrane, and they are present in these wonderful compartments that are multivesicular bodies, multivesicular mm -hmm. endosomes, and these more multilamellar compartments that are very assimilated to lysosomes. And the question was, I mean, how from a degradative compartment, these molecules, can go to the plasma membrane. So first, I mean, we started immunolocalizing MHC class two molecules, but MHC class two molecules with bound peptides, for example. And we had um, a collaboration with a team of uh, Sasha Rudensky, mm -hmm. and uh, because he developed antibodies able to recognize uh, MHC class two molecules with a bound peptide. There was this this development of antibodies that could really localize, you know, somehow active molecules with bound peptides, and we saw that in these compartments with indeed MHC class two molecules that were certainly not in the course of degradation because this was one of the critiques was that the molecules that we were localizing were molecules in the course of degradation because they are in lysosome related organelles. But uh, during these observations on the electron microscope, you know, you can pass hours and hours looking on the cells. Yeah. And um, we basically pulsed the cells with a BSA, bovine serum albumin, coupled to very tiny, small gold particles, five nanometers gold particles. Mm -hmm. And we pulsed the cells, we washed the cells, and then we saw, you know, where these endocytic tracer was going and mm. I was one it was in the end of the afternoon it's uh, you know you, you do we remember yeah. all these details because it's very exciting we were at the microscope I was at the microscope it does and I start looking uh, to these um, multivesicular endosomes full of MHC class 2 but also with the endocytic tracer and I saw that in a, in a sort of polarized way, because these B lymphocytes, they do have some polarity. And I saw like a process of degranulation of these multivesicular bodies. And it was like all these vesicles were 
in a way secreted. I was saying secreted because we also had the endocytic tracer that was previously internalized. Mm -hmm. It was secreted into the hextra cell. So there were cells so first taken up and then first released. And then released. And in between the cells were washed. So it was not uh, I see. It was not So you knew inside. already they were inside of you didn't have any other Yes. Stuff in the outside, right, right, yes. right. So basically because it was wash, it was really pulse, wash, and then we uh, we did different times of uh, internalization of the endocytic tracer. So I saw this degranulation process and you work on mast cells. So you know what is a degranulation Yeah, yeah, yeah. Process That's a really uh, uh, cell that releases a lot of bubbles. Yes. And chemi and chemically active molecules. It's true. And for me, you know, I had these... Uh, you know, all these, uh, everything that we see in the books. And I, I went out of the microscope and I called Hans. And I told Hans, I mean, come to the microscope with me because look at this, what is that? Mm -hmm. And it was really like, a, a pro like these bags full of vesicles that were degranulating into the extracellular uh, medium. And in the media, I mean, in the intercellular space because we are seeing fixed cells by EM. And, uh, and with Hans, we start thinking, I mean, but maybe, you know, these cells, they have, they are so full of MHC class 2. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a way of getting rid of the loads of MHC class 2 that they have. Uh, we don't know whether these, uh, these molecules are, you know, are... But you can see the vesicular structure already at oh, that yeah. time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Did absolutely. you know the term exosomes at that time? No, no, not at all. Not at right. All. Right. So That's cool, we, right? So we, we went to the coffee room. I remember we went to the coffee room, you know, making, you know, crazy schemes in the... Yeah, uh, on the whiteboard. In the paper, on yeah, the board. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I told Hans, I mean, if these cells, if these cells, they have this kind of the potential to release the contents of multivesicular bodies, I mean, these vesicles should be on the medium of the B lymphocytes that are cultured, mm -hmm. you know, they are cultured as non-adherent cells. So we had flasks. So if we collect the medium, these vesicles should need the medium. But I was in a EM lab, you know. Yeah, yeah. So even a centrifuge was in the other side of the corridor. <laughs> so oh, yeah. what I did, what I did is that I went to the, because there was the, EM electromicroscopy department, and just aside, it was the biochemistry department in the medical center. And uh, so the, the head of the biochemistry was uh, Herr Strauss at the time, I mean, very well known in the ubiquity field. And, uh, but I went to a great biochemist who was uh, Willem Storvoho, and mm -hmm. uh, I went to his office because, I mean, normally we had common lab meetings. And I went to his office and I told Willem, I mean, look at this, because he was also working on MHC class two already. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I went to Willem, I said, I mean, this is incredible. So the first thing, I mean, there was not PubMed at the time, huh? We were not using Yeah, Medline, yeah, maybe. This was a, so we went to the library downstairs, we went to the library and uh, we went to, to look on, and, and Willem, because, he was in St. Louis before as a postdoc with Alan Schwartz, and you remember Phil Stahl. Because yeah, yeah, Phil, Phil Stahl, Stahl, of course, published in 1883, yes. right? So, uh, Willem, it's, it's true that I think it was it's extremely important, you know, that he right. remembered that there was something related to what we were seeing. So we yeah. went to the library and we went to, to see the papers of Phil Stahl, and basically, one French researcher, Michel Vidal, in Montpellier, and uh, because they were working on uh, on the trafficking of the transferrin receptor yes. in reticular sites, right. And so we went to the library and we got all these papers on exosomes secreted by reticular sites during the differentiation of reticular sites into erythrocytes. So we got the, these papers from 1993 to 1997, that was from Frims, Phil Stahl, and basically Rose Johnston. 
of course, yeah. Actually, for me, my, my two stars are, sorry, I have a lot of Phil them. and Rose. Rose and Phil Stahl. I mean, and with yeah. Phil Stahl, we do continue publishing quite a lot, quite mm -hmm. a lot of thoughts and quite a lot of, I mean, reviews and papers on what we dream about the field. And, uh, but Rose Johnston, I mean, he, she was also an extraordinary person. And uh, yeah. we went to these papers and we, we told, uh, I mean, the next day I was just collecting supernatants. And I tell you that I did one year and a half of electron microscopy in, in Utrecht, but the, my postdoc was basically biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> you get what you ask for or yes. don't ask for sometimes, really, right? Really, I and it was very rare that you know postdocs from the electron microscopy were crossing the corridor to crossing the borders to the biochemistry. So I did a lot of Western yeah. plots and a lot of right, you know, uh, characterization. Uh, so and and it was really interesting because we start thing first. We isolated the vesicles. We could isolate them. Mm -hmm. We did gradients. We showed that the vesicles were vesicles because they were floating. We did these um, uh, cross. gradients. And uh, so we could see the vesicles. We could label the vesicles. So basically, I, I adapted the, the protocol of embedding that we use for immunoglot labeling on ultracinclear sections. You know, mm -hmm. these uh, positive negative staining that we use for the Tokayashu method. I just adapted it for depositing uh, exosomes on the EM grids and then embed them in uranyl acetate and methyl cellulose. Because if you just do uh, negative staining, you, you don't have enough details. Of course, mm. we know that uh, there is shrinking, the shrinking of the vesicles due to uh, to the heavy metals, the yeah. to the fixative, and of course, using cryomicroscopy, we mm. all see that they are round. But um, this was an easy way to immunogold label, to look at the contents of the composition by by EM, by immuno EM. And uh, so this was really the, the beginnings. But the thing is that still, we, we knew that uh, the MHE class two molecules that were present, these we could show it biochemically. That mm -hmm. the uh, MHE class two molecules that were exposed on the outside, because this was very yeah. important, important to show. Because for most people, vesicles, you know, the molecules have their active site inside. Here, these vesicles are, are like mini cells. Mm -hmm. They are the molecules are exposed to the outside. Right, so right. It was important to show that the molecules that were there had, were in the compact form, you know, because you have the alpha, the beta. And they had the right topology in a. Yes. Outside was, is out and inside is in, mostly it was at least, important right? To show the topology, yeah. to show that the molecules had bound peptides that were not just floppy molecules with the invariant chain. So there was no invariant chain. It was the half a beta chain with a peptide. But then the question was still staying on whether the vesicles were active or not. I mean, had a physiological role or not, because still it could have been, you know, like, like they have proposed in reticular sites that this is a way to get rid of obsolete molecules, mm -hmm. because this was the role, the well-known role of exosomes in reticular sites was to get rid of obsolete molecules that you don't want in the mature erythrocytes. So we, we, had, we started having meetings with, uh, in Leiden with a team of uh, Case Malif, with Cornelis Malif. So you commuted from Utrecht to Leiden? Yes, so, so this was very, very interesting also. Not so far away, right? No, it's not, not far. By, by train, it's not far. So we just went to, I was just going with my uh, supernatants. Mm -hmm. to, to Leiden. So I work with a PhD student there called Hans Nyman. That was a, a physician in the, with, with Case Malif. And, uh, and then there, I mean, we, we start doing uh, ultracentrifugation, isolating uh, uh, exosomes and uh, putting exosomes in, um, in contact with T cells, because of course, first, I mean, mm -hmm. we incubated the the B lymphocytes with um, 
with an antigen, and we had T cells that were specific for peptides presented in the context of this antigen. And, uh, and then it was incredible because we start seeing that the vesicles without cells, we had the control cells with T cells, mm -hmm. and we had the pellets of extracellular vesicles with T cells, but we, we saw that we could induce, you know, T cell proliferation. And this was kind of, wow, bingo, you know, and we did the experiments several times. We also, uh, we, we discussed also a lot with uh, Cliff Harding in the US. So we should just uh, notice, he was the first author of the Phil Stahl paper yes, that you mentioned absolutely. from 1983. Absolutely. I've met him and had lunch with him. He's yes. a great guy. Yeah, so Cliff, uh, Cliff Harting, he was also collaborating with Hulse, but they were working on MHC class 2 in macrophages. Mm -hmm. But given that Cliff was also one of the first ones that showed that B, uh, reticulocytes were secreting yes. exosomes, immediately we contacted Cliff, and Cliff, uh, in his team, what they did is that they were using basically mouse B cells. So in the... In this paper that we published in 1996, of course, Cliff Harding is also a co-author, and uh, Cliff could show that also exosomes secreted by mouse B, B cells right. also stimulate uh, T cell proliferation. So we could show it in mice and in human. And it was important in mice also because then, if in the years after we wanted to use mouse models, yeah, for somehow different somehow things. Yeah. It was already important to, to show. So it was very exciting, but many, yeah. many immunologists didn't believe on that. So the, the, the one, uh, many researchers, some of them still don't believe, it's taken us a long time. But the one thing, uh, the one reflection I have from your story here is that even though you had the ambition to come back to your electron microscopy from your immunology training in, uh, in south of France, right? Yes. You ended up following your data. Yeah. You have to follow the data and yeah. the experiment you do. Oh yeah. Don't depend on what you want to do experimentally. It depends on your data. So okay. this is this is something I think we can we can enthuse young people to do. Believe your data, follow your data, it's and true. if the hypothesis is wrong, the hypothesis is wrong, right? It's true. Right. And this is absolutely true. And for me, you know, I was really, uh, I was very attached to really do, you know, state of the art electron microscopy. But yeah. I just, you know, I, I was so excited about this data that I, I immediately, I did the experiments. I learned to do the experiments mm -hmm. that I needed to do to follow yeah. the data. And yeah. this is really, I think it's, it's, it's really important that when we say, okay, when you do electron microscopy, you are making images, I don't think this is true. When you are doing electron microscopy, the cells are somehow telling you, you know, look, look here. Look what I have in my belly. Right, you know? right, right. Look what yeah. I have in my belly. And then you start thinking, you know, but now I maybe need other techniques that I need to complement to really, uh, you know, have a story. So for now, I mean, now in my team, you know, we still do a lot of electron microscopy. All the younger researchers, PhDs, postdocs, they are trained to do themselves the electron microscopy, but they do all the techniques that they need to complement mm -hmm. a story. Yeah, so if you look at, at the exosome field over the last 10 years or so, we've almost implemented or, or forced people to at least try to make some nice, decent electron microscopy pictures yeah. to show a vesicular structure of it's the true. exosomes or vesicles that they claim to be studying. So I think uh, that visualization uh, is, is helpful, um, of course. Visualization so. is, is really, really essential. And you see that uh, it's true that, I mean, it's, uh, it's very important, you know, to do uh, very good biochemistry, you know, we need to do uh, mass spectrometry, sequencing, but really, uh, I, I, it's true that not even the super resolution that we have now is uh, enough to, mm -hmm. to really visualize uh, what cells have to tell us, you know, mm -hmm. what, uh, whether they secrete or not. I mean, to discriminate between... Uh, 
vesicles budding from the plasma membrane. I mean, it's very difficult to visualize these fusion events of multivesicular body. This is extremely difficult. Right. Because they are very... So the moment where the multivesicular yeah. body meets the cell membrane and starts creating. I've seen yeah. you, I've seen your pictures. You have a picture like that, I think. Yeah. Um, did Clifford have a picture like that as well? Yeah. And Rose Johnson. Yeah. But not many people have been able to capture that very immediate uh, event, right? It seems to be a very rapid event. It's very rapid. And then uh, I think that uh, it, it's true that, for example, uh, now what uh, the team of uh, Mikhail Pegdal in Amsterdam did, Italia, I mean, in collaboration yeah. also with us, that uh, they managed to do the CD63 pH fluorine, you know, the, the yeah. papers of uh, Frederick. You can Verbeek. see the flash of, that you look at the surface of the cell, you can see the flash when the endosome yes. is releasing its vesicles, yes. right? So this, this then, I mean, this we, we managed then to, to do correlative light electron microscopy, but you cannot do it for each, each uh, project. It, mm. is a, it is a project. It is a project in its own right, of course. And it's hours of hours of looking uh, mm -hmm. on the microscope. But then, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, we, we need to find ways to... I did try to find ways to somehow uh, uh, delay the momentum, for example, using tannic acid and... Uh, because these are techniques that have been used for secretory granules. Mm -hmm. All techniques like, uh, you know, doing a fixing with tannic acid, because the tannic acid is going to uh, uh, somehow fix uh, the cytoskeleton. And this has been used years ago, you know, maybe yeah. 40 years ago for secretory granules. So we have been trying to somehow, you know, delay a little bit the momentum. But there mm -hmm. are, you know, if you look, we, when we do co-cultures, and uh, we, I think that using relevant moment, uh, models is extremely important because mm -hmm. a lot of people have been working on in the field. Of course, it's very easy to use ILA cells, RPE cells, and I'm, these are very good models, you know, mm -hmm. to study, um, uh, of course, intracellular trafficking. But uh, I think in the field of EVs, we really need the relevant models, relevant uh, co-cultures and, uh, and primary cells, but also, of course, tumor cells, because tumor cells, they do release a lot of, uh, I mean, both. I'm also promoting things. tissue, understanding what happens in tissue. Yes. It's extra hard. It's extra hard without question, but it's important to, uh, it's, it's an unexplored, uh, frontier, I think, for EV research, understanding tissue communication uh, yes. by EVs, so, right? So this is why, I mean, it's true that although, I mean, so I, I, I never really put apart the EV field. I mean, I still continue, of course, uh, participating in many projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we showed, for example, that uh, uh, prions are released via exosomes, so this was in 2004, and that uh, these exosomes were uh, potentially uh, inducing ne neurodegeneration. But uh, it's true that in the meantime, you know, I'm a cell biologist, I I'm curious about organelle biogenesis, and basically uh, working on these secretory type of multivesicular bodies really led me this was I, when i arrived in paris although i was working on exosomes that's the time you're talking about after utrecht you came back to after paris utrecht, when i came back so i continue working i mean on many other aspects yeah. of intracellular trafficking i continue working on exosomes from dendritic cells together with uh, sebastian Migurin and uh, laurent siporo i worked on uh, basically showing that mast cells can secrete exosome-like vesicles, also with MHE class 2. So this was a paper in 1997. And I did continue uh, working on exosomes, I mean, a bit on a cell biology of exosomes. But I kind of felt that we, we needed to know more about mm -hmm. this general uh, class of organelles that are so-called secretory yeah. lysosomes or lysosome-related organelles. 
And uh, I start discussing, I had some exchanges. So with uh, I have to, I have to stop. So you think that exosomes are lysosome associated? Uh, exosomes, I mean, they are, uh, I mean, the thought is that multivesicular bodies, this is a good question that, uh, you know, it's still not. Because I'm not 100% sure they are. I mean, no. No. Definitely vesicles and, and lysosomes and even mitochondria no. can interact intracellularly, but but uh, yeah, I wanted no. to, to capture that and, and, and pick your brain on it. No, the idea is that multivesicular bodies, you know, are can be assimilated to late endosomes because they have the composition, you know, the acidic pH, mm -hmm. I mean, on the basis of pH composition, because they have some CD63, Lump one, uh, the accessibility to endocytic tracers mm -hmm. uh, is about 20 minutes. So, on the basis of these definitions, they are assimilated to late endosomes. Late endosomes that which uh, fate is to uh, basically uh, fuse with lysosomes to degrade their contents. Yeah. So, now the question, and uh, this is a question, I mean, there are some papers that I think. Somehow, I like the fact that we have different populations of multivesicular endosomes, although they are assimilated to late endosomes, they are not degradative. Because if these late endosomes, multivesicular bodies, if they fuse with lysosomes, it's because they have all the machinery that allows them, snares, wrap proteins, that allow them to fuse with lysosomes. But in the case of multivesicular bodies that are prone to secretion, these multivesicular bodies may have something special. So mm -hmm. they are, for me, I mean, they do have features of lysosomes because they have an, this acidic pH and the composition, but somehow they acquire molecules that allow them to fuse with the plasma with membrane. membrane. Also, the yeah. motors, you know, the molecular motors that mm -hmm. are able to attach these multivesicular body, the secretory multivesicular body. Mm -hmm. So now, actually, last year we wrote a review on lysosome related organelles, and we basically classified these secretory multivesicular bodies on the class of lysosome related organelles. And this class of lysosome related organelles is the famous class of secretory lysosomes like cytolytic granules, mm -hmm. also vibopalad bodies, because they have features of lysosomes, but they are not lysosomes. Because we don't find so many lysosomal uh, molecules in vesicle isolates usually. Uh, no, I mean, a there few is a, of them, but no, not many. No, there is a little bit of lump. And then the, the question is these uh, tetraspanin, the CD63, that is one of the best. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the proteins that is very accumulated in all type of intraluminal vesicles that are secreted, CD63 have been for many years called LAMP3 because it LAMP3, was thought yeah, to yeah. be a lysosomal marker. But mm. my, in my opinion, this CD63 is basically a protein that is associated with lysosome related organelles. You know, even in, in organelles that are not lysosomes, we call it lysosome related, but these mm -hmm. are not degradative lysosomes in the, in the strict sense of the word. You know, mm -hmm. they are not degradative. And uh, the case is uh, vibopalad bodies. I mean, cytolytic granules, they are still thought to be dual function organelles. But mm -hmm. in the, this is why, I mean, I, I did became interested in melanosomes because nursing was much known on melanosomes. And it's true that this appeared in my, uh, you know, in my, in, in my, in the desk, in my desk, all these reviews on melanosomes, because I, I started discussing with other colleagues that were in the immunology field and uh, Michael Marx, Mickey Marx from the University of Pennsylvania. He contacted me, I mean, uh, over 22 years ago now, and I was working <laughs> on exosomes. He was working still on MHC class 2, and uh, one question was to understand how, uh, for example, melanoma cells uh, that do not express MHC class 2 normally, but these melanoma cells, they, become pre they can present antigens mm -hmm. 
and they, they have, because they have this tumor antigen. So one question that we had uh, with Mickey was to understand, you know, now, now I'm really passing from the EVs to the melanosomes because the link was the fact that we were interested in the secretory lysosome, lysosome related organelle. And we came up with a melanosome to study as a model of lysosome related organelle. Mm -hmm. But the initial idea was to really understand whether these melanoma cells, how could they present uh, antigens, although they do not express MHE class 2 molecules, but maybe melanoma cells, they could present MHE mm -hmm. class molecules. So we started discussing about that. This was in 1998. And, uh, and at the end, we started we, we, I, we started looking at different melanoma cells, and uh, a lot of them were pigmented, and we were in a puzzle because we didn't understood how these organelles that are these pigment granules, how melanosomes mm -hmm. were formed. So basically, we passed several years working on the basic biogenesis of these organelles. So, but, and aside, we had the EVs, exosome projects, you know, trying to understand yeah. the biogenesis of EVs, but we had the pigmentation project. So part of the lab was working on EVs, even on the context of infection and prions. The other part of the lab started working on pigment granules. And a lot of postdocs came to my lab saying, I want to work on exosomes. And I said, no, I mean, now you work on the pigment. And uh, Which year I, was this? Yeah, now I have excellent research. This is 1998? Uh, this was 1998, and then afterwards, after because yeah. the first paper that we had in uh, on the biogenesis of melanosomes was 2001. Yes. Mm -hmm. So basically, so this was a JCB paper in 2001 where we proposed how melanosomes are formed, and that melanosomes are distinct from the from lysosomes. They are lysosome-related organelles, but they are distinct from lysosomes. And, and they're not extracellular vesicles. We had a chat about that the other yes, day. Yes, but... these are not extracellular vesicles. But then now, what I think is very interesting is that uh, uh, working, you know, now in both, uh, you know, really understanding the biogenic, the biogenetic mm -hmm. process of these melanosomes, you know, on all these molecular mechanisms, it really, you know, it really helped a lot, everything that we did on extracellular vesicles. And on the other hand, because the same mechanisms basically are used, you know, for the fusion of uh, melanosomes with the plasma membrane and for mm -hmm. the fusion of multivesicular bodies. So basically all that is the lysosome-related organelles. But what I think that really was a good drive was the fact that we start thinking, as you said, interesting to study within a tissue. And working yeah, on that's melanosomes, beauty with we work melanosomes, on melanocytes, yeah. and melanocytes are in contact with the keratinocytes. Yeah, they send over the pigment, basically, right? Yeah. So now, for several years, we have been working now in the context of the skin. So now the projects that came one from here and one from there, one of extracellular vesicles, and the other on pigmentation, now they are together. So now, now they are together because yeah. it's true that the skin, I mean, it's the largest tissue we have, and it's true that in the skin we have this, we have direct communication, but there is also indirect communication. Mm. And maybe in, a, maybe about, uh, let me see, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, I had a postdoc that came to the lab. She, she was working on uh, extracellular vesicles. And uh, we start discussing on the possibility that uh, maybe if in the skin, th this was totally hypothetical, totally hypothetical, whether because we know that melanocytes, for example, melanocytes alone, I mean, they can synthesize, they can produce pigment, but the melanocytes are totally dependent on the on the neighboring keratinocytes in the epidermal melanin. So they need help to. Yes. So there are contacts, 
But mm -hmm. melanocytes by themselves, they need uh, keratinocytes. Factors. They need right. factors secreted by keratinocytes. And what are those factors? And so you have soluble factors. Of course, right. it's, there are tons of papers yeah. in the literature. There are soluble factors. But we start checking on the soluble factors, and we said, this is not a soluble factor. This should be membrane associated. So based on that, so I went to see, I, I was invited by, by industrials to, um, to give a conference. And of course, they are really interested in the regulation, modulation of pigmentation. And we start thinking, you know, on a project, you know, on the modulation of pigmentation. And me, you know, I didn't have any data. No, this is the thing of, you know, when you have some data, you can ask for money, you can ask for budget, you yeah. know? But yeah. they won't give you the, you know, they won't give you the money. <laughs> Research funds, primary, yeah. Primary results. There, this was a guess. So I had very nice colleagues uh, who told me, oh, this is a great idea. Maybe these vesicles, if, if keratinocytes secrete these vesicles, and if these vesicles have some action on melanocytes, maybe this could be a good way of modulating pigmentation. I mean, this mm -hmm. was totally, you know, a joker. It was mm -hmm. a joker because nothing was given that keratin... I mean, there was one paper, by the way, that time showing that keratinocytes could secrete extracellular vesicles. But these were, you know, not primary keratinocytes. So this is when we really started working only with primary cells. More in the physiological context as yeah, well. That's... That's... Start, you know, stopping on melanoma cells and stopping using uh, really transformed cells because transformed cells, they do secrete endosome-derived vesicles, but they do secrete a lot of many other vesicles. Mm -hmm. And this is known for many years. And um, so we went to this primary cell. So this postdoc, uh, when she arrived, it was, no, it was actually 2002, 2003. And uh, Alessandra, she, she started this project on the exosomes or EVs from uh, keratinocytes. And basically, in, uh, then later in 2015, we could show that uh, vesicles that have all the features of exosomes, I mean, based on a certain number of features, because we all know that, uh, you know, it's very difficult to isolate well, endosome derived versus yeah. membrane derived, but we could somehow assert the way the way I look at them, they're all extracellular vesicles and they are present in the microenvironment of those cells, most likely. Yes. And they contribute to physiology by being there. And and Absolutely. some of them transporting better, more efficiently from one cell to another, maybe. But yeah. uh, you know I do it's, agree. it's reasonable. I do agree. So I mean we we somehow had I mean the we said that these were vesicles with features of exosomes based on a certain number of criteria without excluding that we could also have other vesicles, of course. But then we showed that these vesicles could indeed, uh, in contact with melanocytes, modulate pigmentation, increase pigmentation. And uh, so this was important because we also compared, I mean, uh, different skin phototypes and uh, and all these different... And skin phototypes, you mean different skin uh, pigmentation? Yes, different donors, uh, yes, different yeah. donors. The origin of the keratinocytes and melanocytes, they could be, uh, you know, from Afro-American to Asian to, uh, to Caucasian. European, Caucasian, yeah. So all in the different of the different phototypes. And so we saw that uh, in the skin, although we have very tight cell-cell contacts, we have... Uh, vesicles that come from keratinocytes and can educate the melanocytes to produce pigment. And I think that this is, can be very assimilated to what happens in uh, developmental processes, you know, mm. when you have wingless or hedgehog that you may need, you know, uh, carriers at long distances because the, the keratinocytes that are in contact with the melanocytes they can uh, induce a signal, but you have, you know, about 40 keratinocytes to one melanocyte. Yeah. And so I maybe see. you have a wave 
of uh, events you know, happening. Right. Yes. Right. So what we showed also is that under UV, for example, the keratin. If we put the keratinocytes and we we put doses of UV that are very similar to the doses of UV that we have when there is sun, like today mm -hmm. in Paris, beautiful sun. Mm -hmm. and, like uh, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so these uh, these keratinocytes that were induced by UV, they they secrete they don't do not secrete more vesicles, but they do secrete vesicles that have a different content, and mm -hmm. these vesicles even are potentiating even more the, the pigmentation state of the melanocytes. So so basically, the, this was. One idea that we that we could show this was uh, published in 2015, but what I think is that also I mean if we we can make many analogies to what happens also in the central nervous system and I think there are very mm -hmm. nice uh, publications from the team of many teams but among them I mean I have a Maria Kramer Halberts, you know where they show that there is this loop mm -hmm. of communication between uh, in the different central cells nervous system. yeah you know, between neurons and the uh, oligodendrocytes. So I think in the skin, we, we do have this loop also of communication. And of course, now we are really, uh, we have a lot of projects that are on the uh, ongoing to really understand the a, a role of EVs in uh, homeostasis of the skin, okay? But then it's true that of course, and what is the physiopathological consequences of mm -hmm. that? This is also extremely important, I think. So we are. Oh, a, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So we. So these are projects that are really ongoing, and uh, and I think that the more it goes, the more in the team, you know, that the team, the heavy team, versus yeah. uh, the the pigmentation team. I mean, it's it's a really. I think it's a. I mean, it's a very synergy. Important. Yes, but we are also interested, of course, in developmental processes. And uh, my guess, I mean, is that uh, really th these vesicles, uh, it's true that we wrote a, a review together with Phil Stahl uh, maybe some five years ago saying, okay, it's extracellular vesicles, exosomes, uh, it's for bad or for good. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that these are still questions that all of us are asking to ourselves. Of course, they have a role in the in physiology, but they do have a role in disease. And uh... yeah, and, and and clearly they're they're part of um, normal processes in the yes, body, and, and we have a lot of them in our circulation, in our tissues, mm -hmm. and and we just don't understand yet exactly what they do. I think there's uh, that's another reason if you're a young researcher to really uh, pursue exercise vesicle research right to really try to understand this other system of communication in the in the body that we haven't really explored very well you know comparable to to endocrine system or neural system and, and cell to cell communication yeah what i think interesting is also the i mean why sometimes i think on the uh, when you think, I mean, of course, because cells can contact with each other mm -hmm. and uh, cells can use also nanotubes to contact with each other. Yeah. And uh, so many people would ask, you know, so why now cells also need to secrete vesicles? But I think that in, in, in cell physiology, uh, cells exploit all these communication processes for short range, long range yeah, communication. Yeah. Sometimes I even think on extracellular vesicles as a plan B. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of, you know, there's the plan B for cells. If I can't communicate directly with one cell, maybe I'll use- Sending the signal as a bubble. I'll, I'll, send, myself, I'll send myself because I think that these vesicles are somehow right are part of the signature of the cell. And as we know, when you do the proteomics, they have common components mm -hmm. to other cells, but they have their own components. So it's yeah. a, I would call it a mini-me, you see? It's maybe the mini-me, and uh, <laughs> it's the... Uh, mini-me. Yes. Mini-me. We can yes. make a, yeah, a I cartoon see. about that. That would be funny. <laughs> no, this is a mini-me, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think about it as a mini-me that 
the cell the cell is extremely smart we have to think that the cells are smart you know i'm sorry you know it's true that when you see uh, uh, a, a a cancer cell a cancer cell unfortunately is smart mm -hmm. very unfortunately and our body tries to to fight this cell, but the cell is going to find ways to escape. And uh, mm -hmm. in this case, it would secrete vesicles, and these vesicles, I mean, there are evidences that these vesicles will induce metastasis. And this is the for the bad. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there are other cells that will use uh, use it in the smart way. You know, if a cell is under stress, you know, uh, if you see a cell under stress for uh, hypoxia or something, and I think this is very interesting, uh, you know, all the all these links between cell metabolism and extracellular vesicles, mm -hmm. and, and a cell under hypoxia maybe, you know, will start sending these mini me's to signal, you know. Alert, 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 you know. Yeah, we did something on oxidative stress back in 2010. Yeah. Uh, so this is, it's a sig an, an alert signal for other cells that, and I think mm -hmm. it will be extremely interesting to see how these other cells that will gain, uh, you know, this alert, how they do respond, I mean, from this, from the side of their, pro, uh, you know, gene profiling, uh, protein profiling, uh, how do they respond to this uh, alert signal that was sent by the cell that was uh, mm -hmm. kind, you know, it's like uh, you see the ocean, you have a boat, yeah. you have a regatta, and you have a boat uh, that sees that the storm is coming, and uh, when the storm is coming, you know, this boat the other. Yeah. will tell the others, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm ready to die, you mm -hmm. know? It to save like, you. I'm ready to die, but I, I want to save you. And yeah. I think that maybe if we find ways of now uh, trying to, to understand how, what is the potential that these vesicles have to give this uh, alert signal and how these, mm -hmm. the cells that, are, that receive the signal will respond, uh, I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, way of understanding you know uh, the whole organism the whole you know? organism and it's true that in all these uh, uh, all this period of uh, infections you know we all think that mm -hmm. uh, we need to find ways of uh, you know uh, increasing i mean uh, decreasing the susceptibility to disease uh, increasing, you know, the, the potential of cells to respond to stress. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, for me, I would really say to, to young researchers, of course, first, I mean, you know, when you enter now into the field, mm -hmm. and I think that this is extremely important, when you enter into the field, you, of course, you're going to, there are stones of literature, there are stones of paper. I mean, you, you know, I mean, you have been there also since basically the beginning. And yeah. now when you look at the literature, I said, oh, my gosh. But the first thing, you know, go to the materials and methods, see how these how they did it. Yeah. How this was done. You know, don't take it. You know, you see the title. Don't take it for granted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to the, you know, go to the materials and methods, analyze it critically. And it's very difficult to really, you know, to to make the part of what's good. I, I think there is a whole ed education of the young people that are going to enter into the field. Yeah. I mean, young and less young. But there's a whole education, and this has been true in many fields. But then this education, they need to... Uh, uh, to help and to, to try mm -hmm. to pinpoint what, what are the interesting questions and there are very interesting questions. So the one of the issues I, I have with, with many EV papers is that they try to conclude that a certain mechanism uh, with a, in a certain disease is mediated by exosomes via a single molecule. And, and yeah, yeah, and, and maybe there's a truth there to some of, of these data, right? Uh, 
that they contribute, but there are there's redundancy. There are other molecules in EVs, and that's that's also something we need to teach uh, high impact journal editors uh, to to understand that it's very difficult to make a a strict and clear and simple conclusion like microRNA X Y and Z mediates this in this disease through exosomes, right? So so whereas the microRNA may very well be important, but there are other things there that contribute as well, and 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 our scientific methods are not necessarily designed to one answer those questions in rapid simple experiments no. and and two they you know we try to clean our systems to to draw those conclusions so that's yeah. uh, that's a little bit of an issue we have right now in the in so the scientific really, field and this is what we try to to still say now it's so of course you always want one mechanism show that there's this protein mm -hmm. or this uh, rna that is important i mean it's I think even, you know, uh, even when you look to the heterogeneity of the vesicles, maybe we are trying, you know, to isolate, you know, vesicles by size, by composition. I think, as I said, if I see these cells as a mini-me, I need a complement. Myself alone, I cannot do it alone. So You need a companion. Yes. No, but it's true. It's true. So I think that even the vesicles, they, these vesicles outside, when you see cell-cell uh, interaction, I think that these vesicles outside, if they act uh, as a, a little body... As an orchestra, or as like an, an army. Yes, you may have the chef d'orchestre, which may have, be the cell, mm -hmm. but then you have the two chefs d'orchestre and these these vesicles outside the conductors it's true they they mm -hmm. they you you can see it like that and for example when you see that these vesicles secreted by some cells they are secreted as aggregates mm -hmm. you know as there was the, the i mean the the manuscript uh, by james Edgar in the uh, in the team of um Cotty robinson you know in cambridge where they showed that you you have tetrin, this protein that is also important in uh, HIV infections, that you have the tetrin that keeps the vesicles together. So there is a reason for that. Maybe and actually tetrin. when you look at EM sections of tissues, mm -hmm. you can often see vesicles aggregated or yes. you don't necessarily can, con you can conclude that they're aggregated, but they are present together. in clusters, right? Among among uh, collagen fibers and what have you in mm -hmm. that tissue. So so that kind of makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, and this is what you see also in the central nervous system. And there was a very nice electron microscopy uh, that was published uh, by Heather Maria Kramer Halberts, uh, where they, they show that uh, these, these are clusters of vesicles that maybe need to hack together to, um, maybe not in all the systems, yeah. but they need to hack together. To do that. So yeah. I think that is a, is a very, very, very exciting uh, moment for the heavy field, mm -hmm. for sure. And uh, it's true that there are still, of course, believers, non-believers uh, sometimes. But I think that and people need to be more, journals need to be more and more aware, it's true, of, yeah. uh, that there are guidelines uh, because mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, okay, it's, it's already a uh, a whole field now, eh? because when you come yeah, back, yeah, yeah. you know, it's already a whole field, but still, that there are sort of guidelines. I think that the guidelines should not be hyper straight, because one risk of having very strict guidelines is that you, we may miss original. That's, that's something I am I'm also, as, as you know, I'm editor of Journal for Excel Vesicles, uh, yes. which is getting a lot of, of submissions right now. And we have the MICEF guidelines, and they're excellent. Yeah. to guide right to to tell you what to do um, but but i don't require people to follow them in detail yeah. uh, for to publish necessarily because somebody who who does it slightly differently from the way people have done it previously could very well have discovered something totally new so yeah. uh, consistency and methods among all different types of experiments may may reduce uh, discovery discoveries in the field. So, no, so you have to be open. 
yeah, yeah, we have to be open. We have to follow guidelines, but leaving it open. And I think yeah. that this is extremely important. Consider the guidelines. So this is this is leading me to towards a, clearly you're saying this is a very important moment, uh, and and that then you want to think about what happens over the next five years, what happens over the next ten years. Uh, you and I have been scientists for a long time, but we have a new generation coming after us, and. And where do you see the EV field be in five years from now or 10 years from now? Uh, I, I think that from 10 years from now, I mean, we'll... Uh, uh, it, it's not an easy question, but I think... I know. I, I think that uh, in 10 years from now, I hope to be here still. Yeah. <laughs> and still maybe excited by EVs. Yeah, but still I working. Yeah, but Me too. I think yeah. that by by really, uh, you know, focusing on, uh, you know, the, there are many important questions, and uh, some of us are very interested in the cell biology or mm -hmm. on basic mechanisms, and this this is still very unknown, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. understanding how proteins are selected into proteins and genetic material are selected. But also, I think it's a, it will be in ten years from now. I mean. Uh, I think that uh, also the use of uh, model organisms will have much to tell us, and I right. think that the model organisms. You mean can... you mean basically uh, zebrafish or yeah. flies or yeah. specifically genetically modified mice and stuff like that? Yes. Will with think, tools I think, basically. I think that these tools that are being developed, uh, I think, are extremely important. But mm -hmm. still, there are many basic questions on. The, the cell biology and the basic fundamental mechanisms to do that. But in 10 years from now, uh, regarding, for example, the implementation in clinics, mm -hmm. because this, this has been a very important aspect of the EV field since the yeah. beginning. And we know now that EVs are implemented, mm -hmm. you know, even uh, in, uh, in immunotherapy and uh, uh, I think if the if, if there is still a very interesting uh, a lot of interest from the physicians, you know, mm -hmm. to to work side by side with the researchers, to mm -hmm. to see the potential of these vesicles in clinics. I think that in ten years from now, maybe we'll see a a, a boom of implementation of EVs in the as as markers, as biomarkers, and uh, but still understanding, you know, the basic and right. why they are there. Because this has yeah, been I think missing. that's good, yeah. I think this has been missing. But I think that in uh, five to ten years from now, the, and because there are more and more people interested on uh, in the EVs, and we see that when we have meetings and we have these large meetings, I'm always impressed by uh, the high sev uh, annual <laughs> meetings because we yeah. see them... Uh, you know, uh, we'll... uh, you started now. Yeah, we have to talk about that a little bit. But, but before we, we come to that, so I, I, I agree with you, but, but it seems to me you say, okay, there's clinical implementation and there will be um, uh, models, mm. organism models to understand EVs in physiology. I think that's a very important message to take. Yeah, uh, I think so. Take from, from the discussion we've had. So. Mm. Yeah, before we before we uh, before we finish, we have to talk about the 2011 January Exosome meeting, right? Yeah. And actually, before then, I think you went to Rose Johnson's meeting in 2005. Yes. yes. Uh, so I can I can tell you that uh, the person that inspired us to work on exosomes was Espion Telemo. Yeah, uh, I know. And he was inspired by you. Yeah. <laughs> so he he learned about your 2000, uh, 1996 paper. Um, back around that time, and he published on what we call tolerosomes. tolerosomes uh, yeah. yeah, back in 2000. So, uh, but he went to the Rose Johnson meeting, and he, he, he uh, said that was a lot of fun. To so tell me, that's 2005 meeting, small, small meeting. Well, you yeah, and, and really, Clotilde went, I think, right? Yes, there was, uh, yes, there was, uh, I was there, there was Clotilde, there was uh, Sebastian Migorena, there was Laurence Vizvozo. Uh, there was uh, Mark March from London because he was working mm. on HIV, and there was this uh, the Trojan uh, Trojan theory, yes. 
and uh, yeah. there was Steve Gould also in this meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, some uh, of the famous people that we yeah, still they, they some not. Sure for her, of course, and uh, we were about twenty five, and it was a uh, and Ross meeting. Was so excited, and this is uh, from that you know I I, I have really the uh, as she said. Uh, so this was 2005, and she said, oh, for her, it was a, uh, nobody really believed on the transfer right. receptor right. being uh, secreted. Uh, was the Phil Stahl there? Hmm? Was Phil Stahl there? Uh, Phil Stahl, uh, I don't think so. Phil was not okay. there at the time. Okay, that's too bad. And, okay. uh, but uh, basically, uh, she said, oh, for, for her, uh, exosomes were like in a Alice in the Blunderland tale, you know, mm -hmm. it was Alice in the Blunderland tale because she, you know, she, she found that uh, nobody believed and now there were 25 people yeah. around the table discussing in many aspects. And there was um, a journalist from science doing the summary of the meeting and uh, cousin, cousin, yeah, Jennifer cousin and uh, Jennifer said, oh, they'll spit out this, um, these vesicles, but uh, what they do and you know, and it is still up in the air. And this was 2005. This was 15, 15 yeah. years ago. And now when mm -hmm. you see, you know, you go to to PubMed, you do data analysis on the papers, you know, it's like a bomb, you know, it's an explosion. But also mm -hmm. your paper in 2007 was extremely important and it made Thank a boom you. into the publications because showing that genetic material, that microRNAs were present on these vesicles was extremely important. Mm -hmm. You see, because there was... Uh, you know, there was a lot of potential handling. Yeah. So that was, again, an example of following data. Basically, yeah. we were confused uh, about exosomes. We were working on them in the allergy models. And and then we just did what you did, right? Uh, follow data. And, and then we discovered that they carry RNA and shuttle RNA from one cell to another. So that's, it's a humbling experience to, to think about it and the amount of attention it's just received. So... But anyway, I got to meet you guys, you and Clotilde. I was invited to Paris kindly by, yeah. by you a few years later, maybe 2008. I uh, met Marka Wauben as well yeah. at a uh, immunology meeting in Davos. Okay. Um, and, and I started to, to and of course, Espion, and there were, there were thoughts about starting an exosome society or a sexosome. And at that time, I was very active in the field of, of allergy and the allergy, European Allergy Academy. I was even... Secretary General and became president 2009 to 11. So, so um, then you start, you arranged the meeting in January 2011 on extracellular, yeah. on exosomes, right? Yeah. The exosome workshop, or can't recall exactly what you called it. It now. was a HIWE, International Workshop on Exosomes. IWE, IWE. 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 I we, yeah. But basically, this meeting uh, we promised it. Uh, it was a, it was a sort of also tribute to Rose Johnston, because mm -hmm. when she organized this meeting in 2005 at McGill, we promised Rose, okay, next we organize one in Paris, because she was coming to France uh, basically every year. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the time went and uh, with Clotilde, we start in 2009, basically we start thinking on that and unfortunately Rose passed away. In 2009, yes. In yeah. 2009, uh, I mean, suddenly, I mean, she, she was not very young, but she was still very active and she passed away. And uh, so then we didn't organize it. I, I, I really felt bad because I, I thought that we should have organized it before. Mm -hmm. But uh, then in 2011, we managed to organize this meeting and we had a, an amphitheater for 200 people. And uh, we had to, it was incredible because we, it was mm -hmm. really homemade, uh, homemade symposium. I know, I was there. I, I barely got in, but. <laughs> yeah, and so homemade symposium, we had to really re refuse a lot of uh, people who wanted to participate. Mm -hmm. So we really, we even saw colleagues, you know, interested in EVs and they are, they were just around the corner. So, yeah. it was, so we, it was very nice to start collaborations. And then, as you said, I mean, he, I was born and uh, you were the first 
president of ISAF. And then there was the yeah. famous meeting in Gothenburg. That was uh, great. A lot of fun and ABBA yeah. shows. And, yeah, it was, yeah. I think, uh, I, I loved it. It was really <laughs> nice. And um, and then, I mean, I think, I, I now I'm very impressed when I went to, um, when I, uh, I went to, to some of the other ISAF meetings. I didn't went to mm -hmm. home because every year it's very, I prefer to, uh, that young people go to the meetings. We mm. cannot always go. So uh, uh, there's always one or two participants from the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I went in Barcelona in 2018. Uh, yeah. and it was a... Uh, That's the was, only one I missed because yeah, yeah. my wife had, was, had knee surgery that, yeah. that so week, so I couldn't very, go. I mean, I was very touched because I received mm. the ISAF yes. award. That yeah. is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful yeah. crystal piece of art. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so it was very touching. I really, they made me cry on the stage. And, <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it was. Very you, it was well deserved. You're really one of the pioneers of the yeah. field. So you so, know, without your important so, work, we wouldn't be where we are. So. And uh, it's it's very it was very nice. And uh, but I was amazed, you know, by the number of companies. By the number in, you know, by the number of uh, startups, mm -hmm. and um, it's true that I mean, then I mean, uh, of these startups, they just uh, pop up, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, there's uh, many, and uh, and these meetings, you know, with these uh, different sessions and these different, it's, it's extremely parallel unique. sessions, but three or four parallel sessions, right? It's uh, it's just incredible, you know. It's just uh, yeah. more than one thousand participants, you know. It's just uh, and. Uh, I mean, and this year, unfortunately, for those who are listening to this in a few years, this is the month or the spring of of the COVID pandemic 2020. Yeah. So, so we're not going to any meetings this year, it seems, or not many anyway. So, yeah, we'll have a virtual meeting. We'll we're meeting this way instead, right? Yeah, we're meeting this way, and uh, we hope to do webinars and uh, yeah. To continue, you know, exchanging. I think this yes. is changing a little bit our way of uh, communication, but still, yeah. you know, it's a uh, indirect communication. But uh, yeah, exactly. It's better to touch, but uh, tight <laughs> contacts. But uh, you know, I think that yeah. mini me's right. can be sent uh, to uh, <laughs> mini me's and mini enemies as well, right? Viruses. Yes. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah, mini me and mini enemy. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that could be a cartoon series. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true, yeah. and I think it will be really interesting to to do because now we do a lot of um, cartoons, you know, for uh, for the general yeah. audience and even for kids. Yeah. And uh, kind of uh, you know how we how we teach uh, young. Uh, uh, young people. Is, uh, I have to ask you a final question before we yeah. wrap up. It's been a pleasure. But do you think that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is an extracellular vesicle? Um, I, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult for me to have an opinion on that. <laughs> but uh, although right. I, I've worked on other virus, it is, uh, I mean, potentially it, it's not an extracellular vesicle, it is a virus. But the, mm -hmm. the, the power of this virus is that the way they are generated and the way they bud, uh, mm -hmm. they may also induce the generation of extracellular vesicles. Extracellular and they kind of hijack that, uh, yeah, that principle they, with the membranes, they, right? Lipid yes. membranes and so on, right? Yeah. Because so they're using yeah. our lipid membrane of to to create the virus, are, right? And you have the virus. Of course, you have virus. You have virus-like mm -hmm. particles that mm -hmm. do not have the genetic material, but they do have the viral proteins. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, this a... has been shown for SARS-1, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, that uh, that indeed one possible thing is that. Uh, in the circulation of uh, of patients, you may have uh, vesicles that are potentially carrying mm -hmm. the viral proteins without the uh, RNA. Without the RNA, 
And then, I mean, you one can uh, imagine many things. Then it's co sort of overlapping with extracellular vesicles, and there are oh, vesiculation processes in making these vesicles. So, in a way, it, it, at least they're cousins or or related to each other somehow. They so. are related to each other, and the way and and then again, I mean, if these vesicles are released, and if these viruses induce the production of more vesicles, more than are generally present, maybe then we can think it's for good or for bad, you know, either yeah. to induce certain immunity or right. to induce Tolerance. susceptibility, you know, it's, um, it's very open. I think yeah, it's we'll, again for bad or for good. We for, we'll find out. So, uh, Grasa, it's, it's been a, a true pleasure. Really yeah. enjoyable. I uh, thank you very much for joining the pad podcast. This is probably the longest discussion I've had so far because okay. you're so generous with yourself and, and open. So, yeah. so thank you for joining and thank you everyone out there for, for listening and joining us in this discussion. There will be plenty more to come and uh, stay tuned and bye.